Hey guys, uh, there's a bunch of different titles for this, uh, but officially, welcome to Plus One to Social Play, Tabletop RPGs in the Hospital. It only says RPGs, but they're tabletop. Um, I'm Alexander Pereira. I'm the patient technology specialist at Met one of the two patient technology specialists at Methodist Children's Hospital. Still not used to saying it that way. Uh, I'm Adam Davis, uh, founder and executive director of the nonprofit organization Game to Grill. You're muted, Garrett. <laughs> we'll do it live. <laughs> Good reference. Good reference. Solid. <laughs> That's Garrett Goody. He's the <laughs> patient technology specialist at Seattle Children's. Well, he figures out his audio. Um, the good news is Adam gets to talk first. <laughs> if the click will go through. There you go. So just a little bit of, about about us before we get started, and I'm going to stall so Garrett can fix his microphone. Um, so like I said, I'm uh, Adam Davis, one of the uh, co-founders and co-executive directors of the nonprofit organization Game to Grow. Um, what we're most well known for is our use of tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons uh, in therapeutic social skills groups. So most mostly what Game to Grow has, has done over the last nearly decade of my professional life has been using tabletop role-playing games with kids, teens, and adolescents as kind of a, a social support program. So we have a lot of our participants, for one reason or another, there's not a requirement for a diagnosis, but a lot of our participants have, for one reason or another, a, a social setback. So oftentimes it's lagging social skills, sometimes related to a diagnosis and sometimes not. Oftentimes our participants have never really had a friend before, never really had a supportive social community. So we, we, we uh, use tabletop role playing games to, to help them connect with other people in, in, in ways that don't feel like a, a, a social skills training program. It looks like Garrett left. So we got some extra vamping to do, Alexander. Um, but that's that's us. That's uh, that's Game to Grow. Yeah, I'm, uh, like I said, Alexander Pereira. I'm, I've been the patient technology specialist at Methodist Children's since January 2018. Uh, we were one of the early programs. I've been there for a long time. A bit of my background is summer camps and after school programs um, for about 10 years before I've been doing this now for about five years. Uh, any luck? Yeah, I think he's going to get a different mic. <laughs> um, but That's uh, <laughs> we, I guess, Adam, do we want to talk a little bit about how we got this whole thing rolling while we wait for? Yeah, that'll be the next slide, so we can let yeah. Garrett introduce himself for a little bit uh, when we when we get back. So the the, the, the what what we're doing now is we're actually uh, Game to Grow is is using video conferencing to connect in with hospitals and run a, a socialization program very similar to but very different from the way that we run our sort of flagship program so just to tell you how how we got here i've known alexander for several years uh over you know in, in the before times when we were all in 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 seattle garrett you back can you hear me yeah yes garrett who are you it's garrett goody everybody oh my gosh let's go Hello. Yes, are you, yes. Gary? I'm I'm the tech expert, as you can tell by my microphone issues. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm Garrett Goody. I'm uh, I'm also one of the two gaming um, therapeutic gaming specialists at Seattle Children's Hospital. Were we supposed to say more than that, or is that it? No, you're good. <laughs> the, the you know people have been waiting, Garrett, throwing some yes, with <laughs> bated breath. A joke, you know some warm up. Um, thanks, Garrett. So the, um, the the backstory to the work that we've been doing with uh, Methodist and Seattle Children's is um, having known Garrett for such a long time, we, we've been brainstorming about ways to support the children at, at Methodist. Um, and uh, we sort of always wanted to get uh, for some for, to find a way to get our program into into the the Methodist Children's Hospital in San Antonio we had, like met over dinner at one of the PAX Souths may it rest in peace um to to talk and, and connect about maybe doing this and the the struggle always became how do we being based in Seattle get to San Antonio and then everything went virtual um game to grow shifted our entire program we used to be just running social skills groups in seattle and then we shifted virtual after everything went virtual in, in march of 2020 and then we reached back out to alexander and said hey wait a minute <laughs> maybe we've been able to, to to crack this code and that was how we began working with with the methodist children's hospital in san antonio and when did we start garrett 20 early 2021 is that right april 2021 
Uh, Alexander, I mean, thank you. Uh, we, oh, okay. I was going to say, I don't know when you guys started with Seattle. Uh, yeah, early 2021, late 2020. Um, I have the date somewhere and have never remembered to write it down. <laughs> That's but, right. I think you slagged, you slagged it to me. It's been a while is my, my point. Um, so what we've been doing since uh, April of 2021, I think that's the, the right, right around the right time, is we've been connecting to the, the Children's Hospital using WebEx and running our, our program there. And then we built a program, we actually presented about it last year at the symposium, and then building on that, that growth and connecting with uh, Garrett here in our backyard, we've now have uh, another pilot program established in Seattle Children. So here we are today, a, a solid year and a half into the into the program. We've developed a, a, a system of how we connect with the various hospitals and how we run our program. So um, a, a little bit about about the way this process ha has come, and then a little bit more about where what what it looks like uh, moving forward. So this is uh, some screenshots of the programs. Um, there's myself and Adam Johns in there and Alexander. And you can see that sometimes there's two kids and sometimes there's four kids. We've had as many as uh, six, I think, in one session, six, six participants and as few as one. Um, so you can see that there's uh, three adults in the room. Um, oftentimes Alexander is, is watching, not playing, though sometimes he or Garrett in Seattle will play along with us. So we have a nice mix of adults and patients in the room. And when we first got started, we, what are the codes we were trying to solve here is what game can we play remotely without any materials um because you know the, the games like dungeons and dragons are, can be very complicated especially if the participants have never played it before don't have any uh experience with tabletop role-playing games in general so you you know you know if you're a player or you had watched megan talk earlier it can be a complicated game um there can be lots of moving pieces and you doing it intentionally can be even more complicated so what we ended up doing after trying a few different things out is we actually used the critical core game system which was actually designed by game to grow we built this and kickstarted it in 2019 as really a way to use tabletop role-playing games in a therapeutic context but we ended up realizing that the simplified rule set is pretty much perfect for our context as well, because the, there's no rule book for the players to have to learn or look through at all. all everything on the character sheet is all, all the players need to play. We've got, uh, you know, it uses a basic uh, seven set of dice like Dungeons and Dragons does, but it's, and it's very similar to Dungeons and Dragons in that it's a fantasy setting. Um, but it's the, the rules are very light and it's so based in the imagination that we can really do a lot with it yeah which is where it comes into basically what the process looks like for us in the hospitals um which is that both for me and garrett we run around and collect the patients we have to decide you know who's the appropriate participants are, um which looks a little different for us and we'll get to the kind of the differences between the two in a bit looks a little different for methodist than it does for seattle but both the basic premise is we find our likely participants and recruit them and get them convinced to play. Um, in our case, we hand out physical dice and physical character sheets um, and lots and lots of paperwork on, hey, your video, your face is allowed to be seen by other kids, right? Um, you have to sign all of these things. We uh, developed some a four question four pay, or four question questionnaire that gets handed out. Like all this homework gets handed out. Um, and then we have the two facilitators, which Adam, you can talk about a little more specifically. So the way that the, the program works, because as I mentioned, sometimes you have one, one patient and sometimes you have six, what's we discovered after our, our initial pilot is it's really, really helpful to have two game masters, essentially two facilitators. Um, when, as this has evolved with, with Garrett in Seattle, we've utilized Garrett as this role as well. Um, but when we first started in San Antonio, it was myself and Adam Johns. One of us was the game master and the other one was a player. But I, you know, air quotes on that player because the the what we realized is that it's a lot, it, there can be a lot of performance pressure put on the participants if they are dealing with whatever they're dealing with that, that brought them to the hospital the energy to lead the story or take risks or take chances the way that makes tabletop role playing games really fun and dynamic and moves the story forward. So what we realized is that having a second adult there meant that they could be the one to step up and try something out or, you know, move, nudge the story along or ask another player, what do you think we should do 
uh, fire tablet or whatever. Um, the uh, and and the the skill set there, right, is that second player who's the other facilitator has to know when to step up and when to step back. Because some groups, the players are engaged, they're excited, they don't need another adult in the room to do anything. And then that player is great for, for the, the still saying, what do you want to do? How should we do this? Kind of leveraging the social connection in the room without taking up too much space. So it's a really interesting dynamic between two facilitators to run the system. Yeah, and I think this last, uh, are, is Garrett, is Seattle still doing 90 minute sessions or are you guys? Um, yeah, we can talk about that a little bit. I think that that is a really important uh, distinction of having like a person that's able to um, read the room, so to speak, um, and and knowing which leading questions to ask to kind of push the story behind. I always like to think about it as, you know, they shouldn't really think about you being there until it's important and that you should be in the background all the time, I think. Um, um, but you know what that looks like depends on the group and the rapport you've built with them, which is why I'm really excited. You know, when we keep building up the system and keep having repeat um, participants, it makes it really easy to build upon some of that rapport and engagement you've had before. So um, where previously a session one, you might have not, you might have had to have been a lot more involved and be like, okay, well, what if we did this or presenting different puzzles or different challenges um, or solutions to those? And then, you know, in session three, when you played with those players multiple times, then you're like, okay, you can basically just sit there and observe and and um, provide input only when asked. And so I think that balance is, um, it's tough which, to reach, but it's super important. Yeah, and which leads really well into, I was going to say, the differences between our two play our hospitals. So we have a note here of, the story structure is think like Power Rangers, think one shot, like self-contained little stories, except what we've learned at Seattle is that it's not this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do you want me? I, I can go first yeah. if you want. Um, so in, in Seattle, um, uh, I like to think of us as a pretty uh, strong um, nerd community um, in the city, um, at least <laughs> the, the, the parts that I'm most familiar with. <laughs> Um, but uh, we are um, quite a bit different just in, in culture and in, in what we're allowed to do in the hospitals because hospitals vary um, from place to place. So um, me and Alexander both have completely different protocols for what we can do. Um, for example, like uh, receiving photo consents, it's a lot easier for Alexander. It's kind of baked into the way that they um, facilitate some of those things. For, uh, for us, it's um, our culture at the hospital is a lot um, to lean away from using them unless it's super necessary, unless everyone, um, you know, it's, it's just a lot of a work, a lot more effort, and that's just not what we want to do automatically. So, um, for example, we don't have any pictures of us playing this. Um, I hadn't even thought about it because it's just not something that we don't typically think about. Um, but, you know, we have we have more beds in our hospital, and so the, the amount of patients that we can pull from is different. Um, and then we have um, a lot of long-term patients, um, which is different than at Methodist Children's. So uh, for example, we have a really high acceptance rate around 70 or 80% of the participants that we invited um, wanted to do it and then were able to attend the meeting. Um, and then even greater than that, following week, um, they would come back. So we've had patients that have gone um, every, every week that they were here during the pilot. So we want patients that were there three or four times, um, which is in contrast to at Methodist Children's where it's kind of more of a revolving door. And so uh, Alexander has to pitch it a little bit better for me. Like, well, maybe the next day is like two of the kids were here last week and I only have to pitch it to one kid and we have a full party of, of, of three uh, three patients and then some um, assistance with myself and, and either the Adams. So um, it's quite a bit different depending on just how your hospital operates, what the culture there is, um, which is not yeah. something that I expect. I didn't realize how different it would be when we started this program. I was really excited when you, they told me you, they were doing it at Seattle because we've had a huge struggle. San Antonio was not that nerdy. Uh, we're getting there. The, get, the game stores are getting more entrenched and starting to be a little bit. But like, I have maybe one kid in every 50 that I ask that knows what Dungeons and Dragons is. Um, and... They don't watch Stranger Things because, let's be honest, it's more of an adult show than it is a children's show. They haven't watched Lord of the Rings. They have like so developing a pitch with without being able to link to cultural touchstones has been a huge challenge. Like that's been how we. So our acceptance rate is more like twenty percent because I'll go to the kids who I think I would know would like it, and a lot of them are like, 
nah, that seems that's a little too nerdy for me. And I'm like, we were just talking about anime yesterday. Like, fine, all right. Um, but we also like we have a hemato uh, hematology oncology BMT floor, but it's less than it, you know. It's usually like 18 beds, and half of them are toddlers. Um, we don't have large reoccurring populations of just patients in general. Like, um, we used to have a couple kids who came through for cystic fibrosis, but that that was it. Like two or three. Um, and I don't even think I don't even know how many of those still come through our our hospital anymore. Um, so we we've had to get a little bit more clever with our like pitches and our cells and be more flexible with like well we had four kids and then the doctors let three of them go home, so we've got one kid left. We're gonna sell them on plane with us and find some extra kids maybe, go run around to any teen I can think of, um, as long as they're remotely appropriate. Um, and then our goal is for them to just socialize. Uh, one of the things I think Garrett can touch on is Seattle has a little more focus, like goal because they're able to better guess who's going to be there. Our goal is that this is socialization, normalization, interaction for our um, kids. I mean, we've had, Joe, to your point, we've had kids who didn't want to go home because they were really excited for D&D &D and they were like, can we stay like five extra hours? And the parents were like, absolutely not. Let's go. <laughs> like... Um, but our, our goal is really untargeted. We almost never have the same set of kids coming through. So we are, but we play the same three stories, two stories really over and over and over again. This was one of the, we mentioned earlier that the game format is similar to Power Rangers. This, this has sort of evolved as we've worked with uh, Methodist. Um, so the, the plot structure is basically it starts every single adventure is that we, we learn who the players are we learn who the characters are and then all the characters are all whisked away into a sky palace of this powerful wizard named the great garganov great garganov there's like a funny little bit where they interact with great garganov for the first time sometimes for the second time and the great garganov tells them they were selected to be heroes to save the world of tovaris from the evil wizard malvex and his agents of chaos they have to go out into the world and find a chaos object and bring it back and that's basically the mission so every single session they, it, it, whether they're the same players or, or new players, and this is what we learned in San Antonio, is that we pretty much never got the same players. So we could use the great Garganoff sends you for the magic spoon that brings food to life. We've run that one once a week for a year, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and then when we had repeats, we sort of necessity being the mother of invention, created some new ones and we got three. Um, and we only needed three over the course of the year. And then in, in Seattle, it was like the same kids every time. So they knew the great Garganoff the every single time that little bit at the beginning where the great Garganov had that funny interaction had to shift every single time we had maybe one new player three repeat players and so what really um concretized that that model was that that the, the great Garganov could remember some of them but pull some new ones and it was it was it kind of was the perfect story structure for us to to make the system work but then because we had more and more players we were at trying to invent new stories uh on a regular basis. So there's some of them were, were fantastically improvised and there was one session that we couldn't be there and Garrett had to make up his own like on the, on the spot. So the template works. I've almost had to do that at least once uh, <laughs> as well. Stuff came up and I was like, oh, I promised two kids. All right. And then they both went home and I was like, okay, good. <laughs> the uh, format works. Do we want to get over <laughs> the challenges? Let's do it. We've touched on some of this already. Um, but uh, technical issues tend to be, you know, as is un un unsurprising when we get kids on iPads and speaker, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, one of the things we've learned is iPads are really good about picking up mom and nurse talking in the corner or mom on phone talking in the corner um, and terrible at picking up kid who decides to talk with just a soft little voice the whole time. Um, and so we've you know, had to do education on how to mute yourself and make sure the hospital staff understand that we can hear them. Um, I didn't bring a set home, but uh, for us, dice was a huge problem. If I told a kid to grab the D20, the kid did not understand what that meant. Um, Chess X through Eric was nice enough to give us some co all color match sets with every die being a unique color. Um, and that has been super useful. And then one of the other things we got kids really used to doing, they started doing themselves, was 
they hold their die to the camera to make sure it's the right one. Um, things like that became like core parts of our uh, structure. And then Adam can touch on it, but like we have to teach the kids every time. It these kids don't know what they're doing every time. The the other interesting thing about the difference in the in the populations that are the two hospitals is the youth in San Antonio oftentimes say, "I want to be the Hulk." I want to be Hawkeye. They have a real understanding for superheroes, but not of fantasy. Whereas in in Seattle, they're like, "Oh, I want to be a level five wizard with a specialty in fire magic." Like, there's not a there's not a delay. They know the tropes. They understand the way that the system works. So that's been uh, sort of one of these other things that's nudged us in the direction of maybe modifying our game to be a little more superhero themed and the great Garganov storylines are very cartoon that's not really like it it's very silly we we um ha need to work on our um we need to adjust the content of any storyline that we were going to play in a hospital to make sure that we weren't bringing any any content in that would be uh, inappropriate for the for the youth so they tend to be very silly we, uh, we when we do have combat which exists in most tabletop role playing games it's like with living carrots that you have to chop up or a mashed potato monster and things like that. We had a living puppet of a giant uh, cougar who was selling breakfast cereal. Um, things like that. It ends up being very, very silly uh, kinds of stuff so that we don't have moral conundrums around what our villains, you Triggers know, were a huge thing from my management when we were getting this pilot set up that they wanted to avoid, um, including things like don't set people on fire. Uh, um, which, if you want to be a fire wizard, is a problem. Well, and, that's, and I think that speaks to the, the value of having those restricted uh, like guidelines, uh, where it's simplified, saying like, okay, this is the format, right? You can, uh, as long as you can adhere to the format, it helps someone who might be not as experienced as a game master. You can come in and say, okay, the format is, you know, they have a chaos object they have to get. The monsters have to be, you know, non-human. They have to be, you know, fantastical, and they have, you know, restrictions on like. What types of combat there could be so even if a patient's like i set him on fire you could say like ah oh, he's the, the his feet catches on or like the grass around his feet catches on fire and the smoke knocks him back or you know you can get however um precise you need to get with it with you know with having a set of of rules of like this is where you don't go in the situation or this is how you navigate these this framework it makes it um very easy to be immersed and successful without having it to have to be um, you know, a downer on the patients being like, well, I want to be a fire wizard. Like, yeah, you can totally be a fire wizard. It just, um, you, and they might not even know that you have to massage it a little bit to make it um, safe and acceptable for everyone. But, um, you know, that's that's the beauty of obfuscation and, and having a DM screen, so to speak. You know, you can kind of hide, hide the mechanics behind it. And I think that the system does a really good job for that. Yeah, and if you want to, I think we both ended up with time constraints. Garrett, sounds like you have a little less time constraint than I do. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think um, I can just move on to kind of like some of our, our yeah. challenges are a little bit different. Um, and so uh, one of the big reasons and uh, the um, things I'm so thankful for to have a second gaming specialist for Forest is part of the understanding of getting the second um, position would be that I could utilize some of my time for programs like this that, you know, we've been talking about doing for years. I mean, PAX East right before um COVID hit uh, I was talking to both Adams uh I'm like saying well, we got to do this we're like we're right next to each other we can do D&D &D, and then the whole world shut down for a few years <laughs> and so that put a wrinkle in it so you know we've been thinking about this for a while and um having forest there really helps um me be able to do big projects like this where I can dedicate my time and say okay this is I mean this is a way to to see four or five patients in one sitting where I would normally be able to see only one. So, you know, it's also increasing the ability to see more patients and kind of scale up something that's pretty difficult to scale in general. Um, and so we found, um, we, we did have some issues with HIPAA um, or like trying to manage it and, you know, be, be safe about it and, and just be able to mute people when things go, uh, go awry. Um, but we're, we're lucky and we have um, a lot of tech that some hospitals don't. So we have iPads in every room and we also support patients signing in on their own devices too. Um, and there's a funny story about someone using a fire tablet that will come up a little bit later, I think. Um, but uh, so we weren't really plagued with that because if there was an issue with the device, they could just use their own personal device or the one in the room or things like that. Um, so I'd say the issues were like people, the kids didn't want to stop playing. A lot of times it was like they're, or like the pilot was over and, and then like 
uh, they're like, well, I thought we were playing D&D this week, so then I had to step in and make a whole new story and, and kind of build it out, like Adam said earlier. Um, and so once we kind of started the, the initial challenge, or like the first time, but once we had patients that were engaged and they realized it was fun, there's kind of an, an inertia. So like every every week there was a few kids that were going, so I could go in and confidently say, hey, there's two kids already playing. They played it last week. It was great. It worked really well. Um, and that that itself is kind of part of the reason that was so successful, I think. Um, and and that's um, I didn't put it on here, but one of our goals and reasons for having this implemented is is we're trying to do some um, targeted um, standards of care. And so on our CBDC unit, we're trying to um, kind of do a lot of different ways to support the patients and their families in the unit. And one of them is. Um, adolescents and young adults and it's a pretty underserved population as far as a holistic view for them um, for a children's hospital just because a lot of times people donate things it goes towards you know where the young kids and they don't realize there's a lot of 16 17 18 even 20 year olds in the hospital and so that's a population that doesn't have as much resources typically so that's something that we're trying to bolster and so we're used we created a basically a in um ad adults and young or Adolescents being on you know, adults group where we would um, do a weekly game and it kind of evolved and, and, and it fit perfectly to do game to grow critical core. Um, so we tried a few other things that didn't really pan out. Um, and then, um, you know, as a one off and then we kind of absorbed and then this kind of blew up. It was it was uh, we weren't it wasn't like trying really hard to get people to come. It was it was easy every week. Um, and so being able to do that, I think, was awesome and that that actually solved one of our challenges before of trying to get a group because that was the whole goal was to have patients in that in that demographic interact with each other and the system that we use was agnostic we've done board games and and virtual like party games and and video games and so it didn't really matter to us and so this was like the perfect solution for that interaction and i think the results kind of speak for themselves speaking of which we're going to go straight into outcomes now um so this is part of our questionnaire this at the time it was a two but like families will write essays um to us and sometimes the patients will most of the time the patients will write it was awesome and that's all they you know that's all you could get them to say about it and you're like no we need more than that come on um but uh it's genuinely it's things like this it's thank you so much my son has been smiling and happy since halfway through the game uh the program with games like this has helped take his mind off being here. Please continue. I was amazed at how well it worked. Um, we had kiddos like this where like the family was like, but by the end of that stay, the family was desperate to like, how can we stay in, co in contact with you? Can we please stay in contact with you? Can we please stay in contact with these guys who ran this game? It was such a big part. And I was like, the best, you know, the best we could do is like, well, here's their information on Game to Grow. Like, stay, and try to do, but um, because these patients were like, just don't bond very well with it. And then they came to this, and this was like all they wanted to talk about for days, while they were, you know, turned around to visits that were miserable. Um, and then, like I said, we get answers like most definitely, and you're like, <laughs> cool. Um, we've also had child life specialists talk about it being like, wow, like this is a kid I've been working with all week, does not talk, barely interacts. And like, I walked by and he was giggling and like dancing in his bed while you were, you know, like, cause I think we were, I think that might've been the couch coupon. Like he was so excited <laughs> to get a couch coupon kind of thing, all kinds of silliness. Um, yeah, this is our kids being like, it was fun. <laughs> and you're like, cool. I, I love it. Um, they, you know, they wrote it themselves. But also, I'm like, please, please give me more. And then, um, yeah. So um, we didn't have any um, robust um, handwritten um, results, but uh, I did talk to several patients. And then, you know, one that kind of stands out is this patient uh, Connor, um, and also referred to as Fire Tablet because uh, he didn't want to use the iPad in the room. He wanted to use his own Fire Tablet and. His name was presented as Fire Tablet when he joined, and uh, Adam, I think, is a joke. Asked like, "Oh, what, what should we call you? I guess we could call you Fire Tablet." And he's like, "That's fine." And so then, uh, for the rest of the three, four, I think actually he tried to join for four sessions. Uh, every time he was referred to exclusively as Fire Tablet, and um, 
and he loved it. Um, and <laughs> he is a very stoic person. So, you know, during the interaction, um, he's, you know, very, very uh, slow talking and very like low voice um, and would just be pretty, um, it sounds, you know, unsure if he's excited or not. Um, <laughs> and so the next week I referred, I was like, hey, um, oh, obviously, you know, he has having a really good time. And he's like, oh, I didn't think it was obvious. <laughs> and Adam, so I was like, oh, no, that's actually the most I've heard him like engage ever. So um, <laughs> it's just kind of a, 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 a measure of, um, you know, where, where kids are at sometimes. Uh, excited for them might sound like bored to someone else. But uh, he loved it so much that he literally talked to every single person that came in the room was like, oh, yeah, I've been playing d and We haven't been calling it Critical Core in the hospital. Uh, Same, sorry. Uh, they call it d and well, they, they know it is D&D already when we introduce it. So it's hard to kind of tell them it's D&D, but a little bit different. So, um so I'll be referring to it as as D and D, but we are playing Critical Core just to put that disclaimer. Um, but he would tell that to every single person that came in the room for a, a whole month, be like, "Yeah, yeah." And even when he wasn't feeling very well, he would still join in. And sometimes he wouldn't be there for maybe like seventy percent of the interaction, but he would be there for like maybe the beginning or the end, and he would still be listening even if he wasn't participating. And that's that's how much he engaged with it, which I thought was really awesome. And then you know, real quick, this other patient. Um, Kristen and she goes by Momo in the game. Um, so she played three weeks in a row. And I, uh, when I came back to see her after she had readmitted, we were done with the pilot. Uh, and I walked in and she said, the, literally the first words out of her mouth are, are you running D&D this week? Um, and I had to actually tell her, I said, no, but I'm talking about it at a symposium. Um, and so she said, and I asked her, well, would, would you want me to say anything to the people you know, hearing this? And she said, well, they should definitely do it at their hospitals. Um, and then she also said that that she wanted to make sure that I told them that she karate chopped a um, like marionette, um, a, a animated marionette, and she thought that was the coolest thing that she's ever done. So, um, food Which, for thought. <laughs> uh, one of the other things Garrett had mentioned as a unique challenge, well, we right before we get into uh, is our kids are in the hospital. Sometimes mm -hmm. they just run out of energy. Um, or doctors come in, x-ray comes in, they suddenly have to go to a procedure that like nobody told us was something they had to do. Um, even though we asked three times and was like, you know, we got a kid for an hour and a half. That's a big chunk of time in a hospital. Um, and so like, we just have players who just disappear and sometimes they disappear and come back and sometimes they just don't, um, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes they discharge and mom's like, we're not waiting, we're leaving. Middle of game, kid's like, I gotta go, bye. Um, which is part of where having that second person, that play, adult player, is super useful because that adult player can just take over, um, you know, help fill in for those steps. Every so often, I'm like not playing; I'm doing like other work, and something like that comes up, and I and I'm listening in, and, they, and it's like, okay, you're now playing like Jonathan the Barbarian. That I hope you've been paying attention, you know, all week, all all day. Uh, and I'll be like, I guess I'm Jonathan the Barbarian right now. That's um, a that's a really good point about the uh, not being able to necessarily participate in the way um, that they want because of you know where they are in their medical journey. And I also think that is a testament to how successful this program can be when normally getting an hour of time is hard, and 90 minutes is definitely beyond the scope of typical. You know, we I typically schedule an hour or 45 minutes for my interventions, so a 90 minutes is is beyond the range of like normal um, interactions. And so that was a concern with one of my coworkers, like, well, 90 minutes is a big block of time, but, you know, we found that that was actually, you know, they made it work, right? It was it was desirable enough that we were able to make a normally uh, challenging uh, duration of time seem like not enough time, um, which is not typically the case. Um, also, shout out to Elena. We started this pre-Elena, it was just me. <laughs> uh, which was a very big challenge. Having Elena has, like Garrett said, having a second patient tech has made this a lot easier to be like, yes, I can spend an hour and a half here. Um, but next steps, Adam. And I just wanted to to go back in time a little bit to talk about karate chopping that marionette. Um, <laughs> there was a uh, the the backstory there for that one was um, just the, going back to the differences between the different hospitals because we have first time players almost every time in San Antonio, we don't get a lot of, we don't get to know the players that well. But that particular player that was their third time playing, I think I had everybody there for the second or third time 
Um, and the uh, the nature of that moment was um, that that session as I did a lot of collaborative world building with them, which I wouldn't do if I didn't know them very well. And I think I asked the players like, there's a marionette that comes out of this case. What is it? And one of the players said, it's a baby. Um, it's a baby marionette. So this m b marionette monster was a was like a baby, which was creepy, but all the players were like really, really into it. And so that <laughs> quote uh, from Momo was, I'm going to karate chop that baby's head. And then the, the you know, the group um, responded in mirth <laughs> in that moment. And I was like, that's the kind of stuff that needs to be in context. Um, yeah. <laughs> I karate chopped that baby's head was heard from the hallway. Um, but but that was the, the nature of the, the different program there is that I can, uh, the game master can and those when, when we know the kids better, we can do a lot more world world building. That was what happened with the um, the puppet that was the uh, the serial mascot, as I said, give me a give me a name, give me an animal, give me an article of clothing, give me a product. And then they world built together using that sort of Mad Libs uh, structure. It was a cougar with a cuckoo clock on its back um, selling cocoa clusters. Um, and it was uh, the, that was the boss battle was a fighting a serial mascot um, and feeding it cocoa clusters until it passed out. Um, the, uh, anyway, I just wanted to share that that little uh, expansion of that story because I think it was uh, hilarious. Thanks. I didn't want to. I didn't want to go too deep because I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I want to put all in your court. Remember that one. <laughs> it's all good. Um, the uh, so the next steps as we are uh, we we've. we've learned a lot with San Antonio and then we, we shifted to Seattle to see how that pilot would work and we've learned what what's consistent and what's not consistent and sort of the, the learning here is that every hospital is different um, in all the ways that Alexander and Garrett just explained. So what, what are our next steps are continuing to work with both of the hospitals. Um, right now it has been just myself and Adam Johns with a little bit of Michael Moore, another member of our team coming into play. And what for us to scale this, right? Adam Johns and I don't scale. <laughs> so um, what we need to do is get more of our staff uh, fully up to date. They're all awesome game masters who work with sensitive populations, but the necessity of shifting that a little bit to be a, a hospital population is, is important to get them trained up. So that's our, our next step to continue working with, uh, with these two hospitals, as well as as we've learned that the the youth in Seattle return again and again, we need to build that adventure library out. Um, the uh, you know the chronicles of the great Garganov and the uh, evil wizard Malvax and his agents of chaos, and we have to build out that adventure library. So then, in a perfect world, the game masters could know who's been to what sessions and pull one out of a hat and be able to run that right right off the get get uh, right off out of the gate. We um, the story structure is very simple, so it won't take a lot of work to make that happen. Like Garrett said, it's kind of a, a template. You just kind of um, insert new themes in, into it and it works pretty well. And the other thing that we were um, going to work on is, as Alexander was saying, going around to tell the kids what the game is sometimes puts a big burden on Alexander and, and Alexander also doesn't scale to go to different hospitals. Luckily, you all could be the ambassadors at your hospitals. But what we were going to do is build a, like a video. You could plop an iPad down, push play, and it would basically be the pitch. Do you want to play Critical Core? Here's how it works. Here's what dice are. Here's how the story works. Um, so that is a work in progress. We have a script written. We're going to animate it, um, but that takes uh, some resources we don't quite have entirely uh, right this moment. So we got to put that um, in the hopper and make it work. Um, the other exciting thing we've talked about with uh, Seattle Children's Hospital is doing some sibling groups. So Garrett, you can talk about your vision for that. Sure. Um, you know, I want to put an asterisk by this because it's still work in progress. So, um, you know, none of this is official, but um, we've been talking. Um, we just had a meeting last week. Um, this has kind of been in the back burner for a while. It's like an idea. Um, I've done a sibling support group collaborating with our art therapist um, on uh, in the same unit. So targeting some the similar outcomes to the AYA group is um, we want to support like the whole family. So, um, you know, when a patient um, gets cancer, you know, they're family is impacted. So um, we're trying to support that and facilitate that. So I did a, a group with Minecraft and art and it was siblings of patients in the hospital. And we met weekly and um, we played Minecraft over Zoom and that was very successful and the format went really well. And so after doing that and, and talking to Adam and, and knowing how, you know, Dungeons and Dragons works and Critical Core and all that. So I, we thought, well, that'd be a great format. So we could do siblings and, and patients together playing um, this game remotely, and so the idea is it would be um, four or six or, or some extended period of time where they could come and they could do more than just one session. They come back and we know it's the same people every time, and they're they're less restricted because they're out of the hospital. You know, they're 
outpatient or siblings, so they're not going to be uh, in the same restriction as the being in a hospital bed when people are coming in and out of the room. So I think the format will be um, different and, and engaging in, in a, a very exciting way for, especially for patients that maybe have done it inpatient, they go outpatient, and then they could sign up for this group and they could do it and engage, and then they can have even more critical core goodness. They can become best friends, maybe apprentices of Garganoff, who knows? Um, they could be the great Garganets. Uh, it, it, you know, it's all, it's all up in the air, but um, I think there's a lot of really cool potential for continued engagement and maybe they have to collect a series of chaos objects who knows but i think the the potential for engaging the whole family um is totally different than in the hospital and i think both are really exciting but they're kind of on total ends of of what they do and what they accomplish and so i think it's worth mentioning that both are you know those are just two different ways you could do this you could probably go a hundred different ways that would be even a third fourth fifth format that would be successful but those are the two that we're targeting and i think that we have the means to make them happen as long as we have the you know the desire and enough you know sweat equity to make it work <laughs> speaking of sweat equity um <laughs> the next step is also to get some new pilots into some new hospitals well with what we've learned uh in these two hospitals i think we've we've got a, we know what's uh necessary and what's flexible and then being able to adjust that to the various hospitals so on the next slide there's a, a link um, to a, a form on the Game to Grow website. If you are interested in getting your hospital involved, some of you might have filled that out last year. And sorry, Garrett floated to the top because he was in my backyard. Um, so if you want to be the next hospital, um, throw your uh, name and contact information in that form on game2grow.org slash hospital. And we will see if we can get some games in your hospitals as well.